Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Physics 30, Unit D, Atomic Physics Review. Now, general outcome one, describe the electrical nature of the atom. So, describe matters containing discrete positive, come on, protons, and negative electrons, it's negative charges. This could mean talking about models of the atom in terms of protons and electrons, and name the models of the atom and the short false that resulted in a new model. So, Democritus was the first guy. He came up with the idea of an atom. Dalton, the billiard ball model. Now, trouble was what's wrong with his? Well, so Thompson came up with the raisin bun model. Because Talton had trouble, he said all elect, uh, atoms were indivisible. But then it was Thompson who discovered the electron, the electron with the cathode ray tube. Now, Thompson's uh, uh, raisin bond model was good, but then of course Rutherford. The planetary model. He did the gold foil. He um, gold foil experiment showed their nuclei. Now the trouble was he couldn't explain atomic spectra. So who developed that? Well, that was Bohr who explained that with his quantum model. So I expect you to know that. Now next bit. Explain how the discovery of cathode rays contributed to the development of atomic models. Well, cathode rays electrons. What do they allow us to discover? Well, charge to mass ratio and that atoms are divisible. We have subatomic particles. Woohoo! What laboratory did breakthroughs did the CRT allow for? Well, the cathode ray tube allowed for mass spectrometers. Now, we talked about those in electric and magnetic fields, or electromagnetism, but you have a uh, velocity selector. And that emptied into a separate magnetic field. We had force centripetal, force magnetic. Now, as I said, I talked about this a great deal in um, electric fi forces and fields and the mag uh, actually magnetism. So go back and watch the video on magnetism. You can see that mv squared over r equals qvb. Just a reminder. And there's our mass and our charge for our mass spectrometer or charge to mass ratio. And this let us calculate the mass of individual ions. Really quite neat. Now, moving on, explain J.J. Thompson's experiment and the significance of the results for science and technology. Well, he did his cathode ray, ray tube. And that'll let us find the charge to mass ratio. No, that's, yes. Now, um, actually, that's a bad example. How can we find the speed of an electron? Well, we talked about that in a uh, voltage selector. We'll get an electric field divided by a magnetic field. And as I said, very quickly, I don't want to spend a lot of time on something I already talked about. Go back and watch the magnetism. You'll have a charged particle called a positive going in like this will be pulled down. So if you have a magnetic field going into, by the way, when you watch the video, realize I drew the wrong diagram, direction for the magnetic field, which sucks. Anyway, so here, the force electric, which is uh, Q, EQ, is down. Force magnetic, Q 
QVB, QE equals QVB, charges cancel, voltage is electric field strength divided by magnetic field strength. Okay. The next thing, perform an experiment or use simulations to determine the charge to mass ratio of the electron and determine the mass of an electron or an ion given the appropriate empirical data. All right. So a charged particle sent through a Helmholtz apparatus. This apparatus accelerates the particles through a 20 newton per coulomb electric field, the bends of particles in a 5.08 times 10 to the minus 4 Tesla magnetic field, creating a circular path of 3.25 centimeters. Determine the charge to mass ratio. Okay. So let me see. Oh, this is nasty. Oh, this is quite nasty. All right. Anyway, the electric field strength, 20 newtons per coulomb, which is voltage divided by displacement, which is change in E sub K or Q divided by displacement. Now remember that. Now. So here... Okay, going in the circular field, F sub C equals F sub B, MV squared over R equals QVB, cancel one of the voltages. So we're in charge to mass ratio, Q to M. So we want M on this side, which means we go V over RB equals charge over mass. Now we know the radius. We have the magnetic field strength B. So we have to figure out the velocity. Oh, crap. Do I really want to do that the hard way? All right. Now, I just realized, I apologize, this is a nasty question. I need more space to do this. And no, I wouldn't give you something like this. Ah, oh, crap. All right. Anyway, now I put it up. I should do it. E sub K over Q. Actually, that'd be QD. It's 20. The trouble is E sub Q is 1 half MV squared for QD. Or 20 equals MQ, which is V squared over... Sorry. Sorry. We have mass. I'll say charge times v squared over 2d. And you see where I'm going here? I have charge over mass here. So to solve for velocity... Oh, I don't have the displacement, do I? No, I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. I'd set it up like this, but I obviously forgot something. Um, no, I don't have enough information here. I either need d I need my displacement to figure out my velocity. I haven't given you that. I apologize. Crap. Anyway, I would expect you to be able to set up something like this. Hmm, that's embarrassing. Anyway. Actually, let's just make something up. That's easy enough. Say the displacement is 10 centimeters, which is 0 0.10 meters. All right, we can do that. Uh, mental note, I have to go back and fix this question. Uh, I'm going to apologize again, but that's just getting embarrassing. Anyway, so rewriting this, 1 over 20 equals Q over M times 2D over V squared. Q over M, so this Q over M here. So I can go 1 over 20 equals V over RB times... 2 times 0 0.1, so 2 times D. Over V squared. Now, would I expect you to do something this nasty? No, this is this is just nasty. But it is doable because we one of the velocities cancels out. We know the radius, we know the magnetic field, we know the displacement. So solving for V. Yeah, we can do that. 1 over 20 equals 2 times 0 0.1 divided by the radius is 0 0.0325 times the magnetic field strength 5.08 times 10 to the minus 4 over V. So doing a little cross multiplying, 
b equals 2 times 0 0.1 times 20. And decimal 0, 3, 2, 5 times 5.08 times 10 to the minus 4. Now, this is getting nasty, isn't it? 2 times 0.1 times 20. What I'm showing you, it is possible if I remember to give you the correct information. Ugh. 3, 2, 5. So divided by decimal 0, 0, 3, 2, 5 is divided by 5.08, second word exponent to 4, negative 4. So velocity, I got 242277, 2.4 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. Which is, as we've done enough of these calculations to realize that is reasonable, if really quite large speed. Mental note. Go back and fix that darn question. All right, anyway. What was I saying here? Drive a formula for the charge to mass ratio that has input variables. And, um, yeah, what was it? That can be measured in experiment using electric and magnetic fields. Okay, well, once again, in a mass spectrometer, force centripetal, force magnetic, mv squared over r equals qvb. So rewriting this, velocities, one of the velocities cancels out. Charge divided by mass equals velocity over radius times magnetic field. Now, the key here is the velocity using that can be measured in experiment using electric and magnetic fields. So where the heck's the electric field? Well, right here, the velocity. So I should be writing this as E divided by B1. And that's the trick because the mass spectrometer has two magnetic fields. One in the velocity selector and one in the um, detector. Thinking because of the spin. Okay. Okay. Explain quantitatively the significance of the results of Rutherford's uh, scattering experiment in terms of scientists' understanding of the relative size and mass of the nucleus in the atom. Well, what did Rutherford's experiment show? Nucleus. Positive, small, dense. Very small. I think if, you know, if the atom is the size of the gym, the nucleus is the size of a mosquito. Now, what did he use as a particle source? Alpha emitter. Now, KCVS, DA, uh, there's, a, there's a simulation for Rutherford there. I checked it a few days ago. It was working. And once again, sometimes Chrome hates it. So I might try a different one. And if that doesn't work, it's King's College for Visual Science. They, they change their names every once in a while just to confu confuse you. So you go there. They have, another, they have a lovely Rutherford uh, demonstration where you can do it. And you can measure the angles, and you can see how much bounces back, and you go, wow, not much bounces back. Okay. General outcome two, describe quantization of atoms, of energy in atoms and nuclei. Explain qualitatively how emissions of EMR by accelerating charge particle invalidates the classical model of the atom. Who came up with this, and what classical models cause this problem? Well, uh, well it was Planck and Einstein. What classical principles cause this problem? Well, energy is continuous. And so energy emission. And there's also Maxwell, James Clerk Maxwell. Accelerating charged particles cause EMR. But the trouble with this, of course, is if you've got an electron in orbit around a nucleus, 
by definition, it's accelerating. Centripetal acceleration is rotating. It should be emitting continuous energy, which screws everything. But it not emitting light. Sorry, it should be continuously emitting lighter energy and slowing down and spiraling in, but it's not. And it was Einstein and Planck who explained why. Now, next thing, explain quantitatively the concept of stationary states and how they explain the observed spectra of atoms and molecules. Well, who came up with the idea of stationary states? This was Rutherford and Bohr. Changing colors. Just, what do these electrons do when they state? Well, they circle in stable orbits. They just sit there. They're, they're nice and constant. Now, how do electrons move between states? Well, if they gain energy, that's an absorption. Shine a white light through a cold gas, and you'll and there'll be black bars or lines missing. That's the energy certain electrons are gaining, a jump gaining. Now, if they lose energy, if they lose energy, then energy is given off in certain colors, certain wavelengths. Now, describe that each element has a unique line spectrum. Explain qualitatively the characteristics of and the conditions necessary to produce continuous line emission and line absorption spectra. And predict the conditions necessary to produce a line emission and line absorption spectra. Well, continuous line emission, you heat a solid. Line absorption, that's getting into a black body. Now, that's what I mean, continuous, uh, like the spectrum. Now, sorry, I skipped that. Describe that each element has a unique spectrum. Well, as each, since each element has unique energy levels, the, as it jumps up and down, it releases or emits energy at a certain... No, hang on. Let me make a mistake here. Sorry. Oh, I missed something. Line emission, that's the hot gas, not continuous. Um, but a gas will be a, a hot gas will be a line of emission because the atoms of each element will emit certain light. Line absorption is a cold gas. So let's do an example here. I said there's a hydrogen atom. Oh yes, this uh, Colorado education is a lovely simulation of discharge tubes. Anyway, so if the electron is here and it jumps up to the third energy level, that is 13.6 minus 0 0.85. It has to, oh no, sorry, sorry, minus 1.51, 1 .51, sorry. So that is 12.09 electron volts it absorbs. Now, I'm just going to say what happens here. Right, now, this gets, um, in a moment I'll talk about how can it, what happens if it absorbs 13. Well, it can't. It can absorb 12.09. Or a, some, a certain number here. Anyway. Oh, sorry, getting in myself. Why are, certain, why are some possible transitions not shown? Well, you're getting into, well, we can, there will be hundreds of them here. And when we get high up and 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, they, they get all smeared together. And it's too, too hard to do a calculation. Anyway, suppose an electron of our hydrogen atom is excited to its second energy state, n equals 3. When it falls back, how much energy is released? Well, I just answered that question for myself, getting ahead of myself. It absorbs 12.09 electron volts to go up. So when it falls down, it will emit a photon of 12.09 electron volts e equals hf, which is hc over lambda. We can figure out the frequency and wavelength of that photon. I'm not going to do that. You guys can. Now, 
moving on. Calculate the energy difference between states using the law of conservation of energy and the observed characteristics of an emitted photon. Predict the, well, that's E equals HF. I'm repeating myself. So we can figure out the energy of the photon. I don't want to. Or we can do the frequency. Sorry, we just figured out the energy, but we can turn that in frequency or wavelength if you wanted to. I don't want to. Now predict the possible energy transitions in the hydrogen atom using a labeled diagram showing energy levels. Just like we did. Now, that applet I mentioned on the previous page, that KCVS1, you can do uh, energy level differences and convert that to colors, I believe. So you can go try that if you want. Now, observe line emission line absorption spectra. Observe the representative line spectra of selected elements. Now, a continuous spectrum is all the colors. An emission is you're emitting certain lines only. An absorption spectra, you're missing or absorbing certain lines only, but not everything. Now, identify the elements representing the sample line spectrum by comparing them to representative line spectra of the elements. From these lines here, you can figure out what elements you're looking at. Now, it's a lot easier if you look at this and go, here's hydrogen, and here's helium. Now, you notice how hydrogen has a reddish line here, a blue-green, and a couple of blue lines here. Now, look at this absorption spectrum here, this emission. These are the same elements. Do these lines match up? I'm going, sort of. The blue-green here looks to be different, and this red looks to be different. Now, most helium, it has a blue-green, it has a green, a yellow, and lots of reds over here, and a very dark, faint blue there. This is definitely not helium. Could it be hydrogen? It could be if my scales are off a little bit. I tend to think it is. Which is not a, not a particularly good example. My apologies. Anyway. Use library and electronic research tools to compare and contrast quantitatively the classical quantum, quantum models of the atom. Well, Democritus came up with the atom. Dalton, atoms are indivisible. Thompson, atoms have elect negative electrons in a positive bun. And Rutherford, well, he had the planetary model. Electrons, a small positive nucleus. Now, bore the electrons in certain discrete energy levels. We call them orbitals. That are multiples. Of their wavelength. Jump up, absorb energy, fall down, emit energy. This is emission. And I should and absorb uh, energy is absorption. And all of this, of course, E equals HF, which is HC over lambda. Did enough of those calculations in EMR. I'm not going to do them here. Okay. Now, general outcome three. Describe nuclear fission and fusion as powerful sources, energy sources in nature. Now, first thing, describe the nature and properties, including biological effects of alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. So, penetrating ability... Alpha is the least, it's hydrogen, it's helium gas. Beta particles are electrons or anti or positrons. Electricity, they can penetrate some. Uh, gamma radiation, by far the most dangerous. 
They had the most penetrating ability, the danger if absorbed. Oh, this is sneaky. Danger of absorbed if the emitter is absorbed. You eat something that produces gamma radiation, the gamma radiation shoots through you. That's a, that can be a problem. But surprisingly, eating an alpha emitter is the most dangerous. Yes. Surprisingly. Um, but generally, just being exposed, uh, alpha uh, gamma radiation is by far the most dangerous. It's not so bad if you eat it and it shoots through. Anyway. Yes, there's a thorium atom. Spy was killed. And no, 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 never mind. Not going to talk about uh, poisoning people. That'd be wrong. Fun, but wrong. Right, nuclear equation using isotope notation, alpha, beta, yeah. Okay, alpha, beta negative, beta positive decay, gamma decay. Note, oh, my apologies. That minus sign is supposed to be here for an antineutrino. Change the font and it got moved over. It's beta positive. For beta positive decay, making a positron. And notice for gamma decay, the numbers don't change because gamma radiation is straight energy. No protons and neutrons are harmed. The next thing is perform simple non logarithmic half life calculations. If you start with 300 grams of radium 223, half life 34 years, when do you have 37.5 grams left? N sub zero, this is the one in the formula sheet. The one, if you did math 30, this one is easier to use. So, you stop that. You end up with 37.5 grams. You start with 300. That's one half time divided by 34.0 years. Now, divide both sides by 300 grams. You have 0 0.125 equals 1 half time divided by 34. Now, go ahead and graph this. That's certainly one good way to do it. And right off the bat, graph y1 equals y2 equals. Now, the other way to do it is to realize 125 is 1 eighth, which is 1 over 2 cubed. It was one half t to the 34. Actually, I should be writing the cube like that. In which case, bases are the same, so exponents three, 36, 90, 102 years. Hang on, 34 days or 34 years? Years. Okay. So I expect you to be able to do a simple half-life calculation without doing logs. Graph it, in which case you will get 102 years. And that's the problem. The, the x-intercept, you might have to make your graph windows a lot bigger. Now, next thing, use the law of conservation of charge and mass number to predict the particles emitted by a nucleus. Interpret common nuclear decay chains. Radian 220 forms polonium-216, which forms lead-212, which forms bismuth-212, which forms thallium-208. So, that's the standard uh, decay chain. And you see it written there on the right. Now, what you have to be able to do, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. Now here, you have to realize there's bits missing. Now, in um, to predict the particles, sorry. So, if we're going radian 220, now I have no idea what the atomic number is for radian, so I'm going to go to my formula sheet. 220RN is. Radian, where is that? It's near lead. Oh, this is embarrassing. Two, 
20. Oh, there we go. 88. No, that's radium. Oh, there we go. 86. Oh, forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, getting old. So, going to 216 polonium. Now, that's 4. Now, I'm willing to bet that's... If you go to 84, we see polonium, yes. How do I know? Because 4,2 helium. Alpha emission. Now, 216,84 polonium forms 212 lead. That's going to be another, but 212 lead forms 212 bismuth. What the heck? Well, lead, PB, plumus, is 82. Bismuth is 83. Something there. Well, it's gained. Notice the number of nucleons. Sorry. If we go to our periodic, sorry, if we go to our data table, physics principles, conservation of nucleons, number 8, 212 equals 212, so something's spit out, 0. But you'll notice you've gone from 82 to 83, so by conservation of charge, this must be minus 1, beta negative decay here. Okay? But I suspect that I just did the next question. Oh, no, I haven't. But what's happening? What bits are coming up? Oh, I completely forgot my anti-neutrino. I'm supposed to include that. Poopy, yell at myself later. Okay. So, predict what it's made, including the uh, uh, neutrinos and anti-neutrinos. Now, graph data. Next thing is graph data from radioactive decay and estimate half-lives. So, if I give you time in days start off here. Now, the numbers got cut off in this graph, zero. So if I got 100% or 100 grams, where's 50? 50 half is right here. So that's one half life. What is that? Three point something days. Crap. That's hard to tell. Now, what about two half lives? Well, two half lives would be 25% or 25 grams, depending on what I start with. It's right there. That's about seven days. Ooh, that's right in the middle. So two half-lives is seven days. One half-life, 3.5 days. Yeah, from a crude graph, I agree with that. Okay. Now, compare and contrast. Sorry, I apologize. I realize I'm going through this rather quickly, but you shouldn't understand. This should be a reminder for you. And compare and contrast the characteristics, characteristics of fission and fusion. Now, fission, large nuclei break up. Fusion, what happens? Two small nuclei combine. Now, this large nuclear breakup is spon often spontaneous. I should say that. Oh. Now, it's also, if it's controlled, the nuclear reactor. Now, fusion, we have to force to happen, is usually exothermic. Remember the cutoff point is like iron. So if the atoms are smaller than iron, we combine them, or we combine them, and the total is smaller than iron, it will be exothermic, give off energy. Anything bigger than iron, we, we can break up, and it should be, it can be spontaneous, but will be exothermic, give off more energy. Now, uh, fusion, very high activation energy. There are millions. Usually a fusion reaction on Earth, we have to trigger it with a fission reaction. So we have to get a hyd if we have to get an atomic bomb to set off our hydrogen bomb. Now I want to stress here this is larger atoms. Sp uh, spontaneous fission 
iron. Let's cut off point smaller atoms. We can uh, force to do fusion and be exothermic. Now, relate qualitatively and quantitatively the mass defect of the nucleus to the energy released in nuclear reactions using uh, Einstein's concept of mass energy equivalence E equals mc squared. Compare the energy released in nuclear reaction to the energy released in chemical reaction basis of energy per unit of mass. Well, here, um, something like with nuclear, it's like 10,000 times more energy per kilogram. I showed you the handout where it's like how many thousands of train loads of coal to heat a thermal reactor to you um, in a coal-fired power plant versus one carload of uranium oxide or 600 kilograms of helium of hi uh, helium hydrogen deuterium sorry for a fusion reactor yes something like 10,000 times more energy per kilogram a lot which is why we like it so much now going on sorry is that this is, I apologize for going so fast, but this is a lot, and you're supposed to remember this. Now, general outcome four, describe the ongoing development models of the structure of matter. Identify how the analysis of particle tracks contribute to the discovery and identification of the characteristics of subatomic particles. And once again, King's College for Visual Science. Oh, come on, oh, come on. Stop that, people are watching. KCVS. They have a lovely cloud chamber app. They have this annoying habit of changing its name. The last time I checked, it worked fine. This link worked. Anyway, two particles, Y and Z, emitted by a radioactive source at point P, made tracks in a cloud chamber as illustrated in the diagram to the right. A magnetic field acted downwards into the screen. Now, poorly worded, into the screen means magnetic field is going like this. Careful measurements show that both tracks were circular, the radius of Y track being half the radius of the Z track. Which of the following statements is certainly true? Both particles carry positive charge. Well, let's look. Second left-hand rule, sorry, third left-hand rule. If we grab a right hand, index finger, sorry, middle finger shows direction of magnetic field in. Direction of charge is to the right and thumbs up. So yes, both particles carry positive charge. If we try it with the left hand, they would curve down. So both particles, so negative charge is wrong. Okay, now here we're getting into mass and charge. Poopy. All right, now this F sub C equals F sub B, MV squared over R equals QVB, so cancel one of these. MV over R equals QB. So what's happening here? We're solving for radius. So R equals MV over QB. All right. So what's true here? The mass, speed. Okay. So let's look back at the picture here. And I like this, so let's take another look at this. Color code this. I want to note R of Y is, well, radius of Y. Is, oh, sorry, I said it right here. It's half. The radius of Y track being half that of radius of Z. So radius of y is one half radius of z. Okay. No, oh, sorry, that's a bad way to put it. My apologies. Poorly worded question. No, that that is. My apologies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm attempting to turn. 
a partly worded question into an equation. All right, so Z, so the radius of the Y track being half that of the Z track. So radius of the Y is, oh, sorry, let me phrase this. If this is five, then this radius is 10. So writing it like that, radius of Y is one half radius of Z. Okay. So the mass of practical Z are the speed. Now, if this isn't, sorry, this is another one of those ratio and proportion questions. So what happens if we increase Y versus Z? Well, let's look at Y. The radius of Y is whatever. How do we make it equal one half radius Z? Well, what do we multiply by a half? Either the mass is a half, mass of Z is half, Or the velocity would have to be half. The speed, particle Z. Oh, hang on. The speed of particle Z is half velocity. Or the charge of particle Z is twice. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. I have to get a cough drop. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. I'm not doing a very good job of explaining this. Let me try again. Oh, what is your issue? Stop that. Seriously, stop that. Okay. Uh, now, I want to stress here two things. One, I'm getting old, but more importantly, R equals MV over QB. So, so the radius of y is one half the radius of z. So my zy z oh god help me dy equals qy b. Now notice the, ch the magnetic field isn't changing. What can we change? The mass. So if we double the mass of Z, we would, uh, doesn't work. Sorry. This is one half mass. So one half, Z, so Z being half the mass works. What else works? What happens if we, if the speed is half that? That should work. And what happens to charge of particles twice? 2Q. That should work also. So honestly, the only two we're certain are wrong are both particles carrying negative charge and the mass of particle Z is twice that of particle Y. All right, Eureka, watch this. Go back and prove me wrong. Because I know I'm making a mistake here. I'm just too old and too tired to figure it out right now. I know I screwed that one up. Chocolate for the person who can prove it. All right. Now, explain qualitatively in terms of the strong nuclear force why high energy particle accelerators are required to start these, uh, study subatomic particles. Well, here, high speed collisions are needed to fly particles to create subatomic particles. The, electromagne ugh, the electromagnetic force must be overcome to have particles such as proton collides, and particles are accelerated by electric fields and bent by magnetic fields. So you're dealing with a great deal of force to, uh, to smash protons together. They've got to be moving really fast. They've got to collide really hard. Now, um, if you go to the this microcosmweb.cern, they talk about um, they have a nice demonstration there where they talk about this and the forces and the acceler the forces necessary. They're getting quite close to the speed of light. Now, describe the modern model of the proton and neutron as being comprised of quarks, plural. So proton, that's an up quark, an up quark, and a down quark, and a U, U, D, and a neutron is an up, down, down. And remember, quarks can change, and up can become a down, that is a proton. That's what happens when a proton becomes a neutron. 
and a beta, beta positive particle. And of course, my neutrino, I've got to include that. Okay. Now, compare and contrast the up quark, the down quark, the electron, and the electron neutrino, and their anti particles in terms of charge and energy. It's quite easy, fortunately. If you go to your formula sheet, first generation fermions, second page of your data sheet, they list all this the charge and the mass. Now, use accepted scientific convention express mass in terms of mega electron volts per c squared when appropriate. Practice convert one of these energies to kilograms. Now, you're going, what the hell? Now, one mega electron volt per c squared. Well, hmm, well that's easy enough. If you go to the second page, uh, the mass of an electron. It's approximately 0 0.511 mega electron volt per c squared. Now remember, this is all E equals mc squared. If you've got energy in electron volts, this works. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time doing this. I'll show you how to set it up because we've been at this for 45 minutes. The mass of an electron, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 of a kilogram times 3.00 times 10 to the Ah, uh, 10 to the 8 meters per second squared. Sorry, squares goes on the outside. That gives you energy in joules. Now, correct? However, you can turn that into energy in electron volts and then turn that into me mega electron volts, millions of electron volts. Okay, so if you take your mass, and remember your original mass, you now have that mega electron volts. But if you divide both sides by 3 times 10 to the 8 squared, you have mega electron volts per c squared. So that allows you to turn very small units of kilograms into larger units of mega electron volts per c squared. I'm not doing one of those. We've done that. I want to save a little time because we're running out of time here. Now, use hand rules to determine the nature of the charge on a particle. Like what we did back here in this poorly described uh, cloud chamber. You use the second, third left hand rule or third right hand rule to tell detection a uh, direction of magnetic field and force. Now, where was I? Sorry. Wrong page. All right. Predict the characteristics of elementary particles from images of the tracks in a bubble chamber within within an external magnetic field. Well, we just talked about that. Analyze qualitatively particle tracks, subatomic particles, other than protons, electrons, and neutrons. KZVS has a lovely cloud chamber app. Go play with it. I'm not going to try drawing one and explaining it. So much nicer if you can play with it there. And that's it for me. So, I realize I did that kind of quickly, but that's life, and this is the preview. Got any questions, shoot me an email.